don't know if you, like me, ever caught on to the trend. I won't say even it was a trend in my household. I just remember reading a couple books as a kid that were those choose-your-own-ending books. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You would read, and you'd get to a certain point. It was like, if you choose to do A, turn to page 38. And if you choose B, turn to 57. And I was like, all right, you know, I don't know what the appeal of the book was other than like I could make choices that I wouldn't normally make in everyday life and just see what would happen, you know, because um, generally I feel like I, I, was, a, I was a pretty good kid and, and knew what the right decision was, I guess, although my parents might, might say otherwise. Um, but, but the word that I felt God lay on my heart as I was preparing for today was that you may not have chosen your circumstances, but you get to choose the outcome. And he's given you that ability. He's put it in your hands. And I want to empower you this morning. Um, I've been thinking on Daniel. And that's going to be our main passage today if you want to bookmark it in your Bible. But Daniel, who lived the entire life that we know of him in captivity. And God's been speaking to me a little bit about thriving in captivity. That no matter what your circumstances tell you and, and what it looks like around you, he's destined for, for you to thrive where you are. And it might not look like what you thought it was going to look like. We talked a little bit about that last time, but he's still got a plan and a purpose in the middle of it. And uh, he's, he's so much greater in his intention than anything that we could manufacture on our own. Um, we've been closing up this summer season of life groups. If, if you are new, it is a perfect time to, to jump in because we're starting the fall groups. But we're finishing up our Lord of the Rings life group, which has been the coolest and maybe nerdiest life group I've ever been a part of. Um, we're reading through the book and talking through spiritual themes. And so it's kind of the outflow of everything that's on my mind lately. I don't think I've read this much since school. So it, but it's been really pleasant. I'm actually really enjoying it. But this quote was sort of ringing in my heart and in my mind, and if you've read the book, you know it, or if you've seen the movie, you've known it. Um, it's, in, it's in the first book where, where Gandalf and Frodo are having this conversation, and Frodo's expressing to him that, you know, he wished the season had never happened to him, and he wished that these circumstances had never fallen upon him, you know, to do this thing that he has to do. And, and Gandalf says this well-known quote. He says, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And I believe that's a word from the wizard, from the Lord for you this morning, however that, however that works, you know. Um, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 4? We're not going to stay here. Like I said, we're going to jump into Daniel, but I wanted to use this as a springboard to set the tone for the story that we're going to unfold this morning because, uh, as you may know, I've been, I've been reading now in the New Testament about Jesus, which has just been a blessing. Anytime I feel like you, you introduce Jesus to any set of circumstances, it's like better than it was before, and I'm finding that to be the case in my life, and, and as I'm reading and just seeing kind of freshly who he is, um, so I, I've been going through this chronological plan, and what that entails basically is, uh, you know, you'll read a chapter in one of the Gospels, and then a part of another chapter in another Gospel, because they're basically trying to coordinate it in a, some sort of an orderly fashion. And so this same parable that Jesus tells in Mark chapter 4 comes up in a couple different locations, and it's something that you may have even heard if you grew up going to Sunday school or anything like that. Um, it was something that I'm familiar with. So, so we're going to unpack it just, just as a springboard this morning. But what Jesus says at the end of telling this parable is anyone with ears to hear, let him hear. And I just pray that would be a uh, you know, divine word for you this morning, that God would give you ears to hear and a heart to receive what he's, what he's doing in this season and what he wants to do in your life because I believe it's real and it's tangible. So Jesus tells his story. He says there's this farmer, he's sowing seed. And he casts his seed. Some of the seed falls along the walking path and all the seed that fell there obviously didn't get to grow at all. It was trampled by the feet of men and it was taken by birds who found it and thought it was good to eat. Another type of seed fell on rocky soil. That seed didn't have very good roots because it was all rocks and it grew a little bit, but because it didn't have any roots, it quickly withered and died. The third type of seed he talks about is one that grows among weeds. Uh, it grows fine, but it grows with the weeds growing around it, and the weeds basically choke the life out of the seed and the plant, and it never builds any maturity or bears any fruit. And the fourth type of seed is the one that, that falls on good soil, and it bears fruit, uh, you know, multiplied amounts of fruit. And 
So the people and the disciples all hear this story. Jesus tells it. He sort of leaves it as, if you have ears to hear, let, let you hear, and then goes on. And then later on, he gets together with the disciples, and he explains to them a little bit more the meaning of this. And that's where I want to pick it up in Mark chapter 4. And let's start at verse 14. The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. If I can pause for just a moment and implore you to do what you can to dig your roots down deep, to take the seed and the word that you get here on Sunday or in your time during the week or when God speaks to you while you're driving your car and allow those roots to go down deep and really invest in what God's telling you because if you do that, that's the only way that you're gonna grow. You know, the interesting thing before we finish here is you know, the, the seed is God's word and it's planted and it's sort of an image of our lives, but really, you determine where you're planted in this scenario. You determine whether you fall on the path and it just kind of comes to nothing, whether you fall in a place where you can't even put your roots down. It's you that's making the decision. Yes, God has given the seed and every seed has a potential for growth and has a potential for God's promises to come out of it, but it takes your steps of obedience to have that seed planted in the right location. The seed that fell among the thorns, he said, in verse 18, represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things so no fruit is produced. If we're honest, I feel like as an American church, if you're in church on a Sunday morning and, and you're kind of doing what you can to faithfully you know, serve the Lord, that's probably where we lose it. We probably fall along the lines of the one that, that's got the weeds growing around it because it's not about missing salvation. He didn't say it never grew. What he said was the weeds grew up around it. The lure of wealth, the desire of other things, choked it out so no fruit is produced. If the enemy can't keep you out of God's kingdom, the next thing that he wants to do is rob you of your inheritance. You have an inheritance in the name of the one that you serve that is just given freely to you. And it's about you making the decision to, to plant yourself in the right location. And too often, I think we allow ourselves to be choked out by the desire and the thought that something else is going to satisfy. Can I tell you, you won't mature in your faith until you come to a place where you realize there is nothing else that can satisfy you. And that's not just a churchy statement. Don't let it just be that. Because it's easy to come to a church and to even sing some songs and to hear a great message and rah, rah, and walk out the door and not allow it to take hold and to take root in your heart that God is truly, truly the only one that can satisfy you. If you don't have a revelation of that yet, just pray even this week that the Holy Spirit would give you a revelation that he is the only one that can bring you satisfaction. Because there are so many counterfeits that the enemy would love to offer us. And yeah, we think everything's going great. And look, I'm planted and my roots are going deep. And I'm getting taller and I'm growing stronger. And we don't realize that we don't have any fruit. If there's no fruit, it's because there are other things that are choking it out in your life. And I want to encourage you, you have the ability to pull those weeds and those tears out so that you can grow unfettered. And I want that for you. I believe the heart of God wants that for you this morning. And he says in verse 29, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word. Don't be hearers only, right? But doers and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. Do you get that produce is an active word? It's not just that, okay, I have God's word. I'm going to put it in my heart, and yay, I'm a Christian now, and everything is fine and dandy. I don't know if you've realized it takes a little bit of work every day. It takes some cultivation every day. And sure, there are times where we fail and falter and God's got grace for us, but he's trying to bring us to a place of spiritual maturity where we realize it takes some work to produce a crop, to produce a harvest. And the harvest that we're talking about specifically is in one of your heart. God wants you to work on the harvest of your heart. 
I wanna challenge you to do that. I wanna challenge you to take a pen and a notepad if you can. There are some in the pews I know. And to write down some of these things we're gonna talk about this morning and allow them to permeate your heart. And as you have your devotion time this week or you're driving and you have some time to reflect, take one of these passages and really consider what it means for you where you are and in the places that you work and in the school year that you're about to start and in the family that you're in. You know, if we can take these words and apply them to our lives, we will truly have kingdom fruit. And I believe that's what we all want. That's why we're here. I don't think any of us would be here if we didn't really want what God had to offer us. The problem is sometimes we're not willing to pay the price that it costs to receive the fruit that he wants to produce, if we're honest. God wants to produce fruit in you. God's given you the seed. It's up to you where it's planted. Flip with me to the book of Daniel. We're going to buzz through quite a few chapters here as we kind of go through his whole life as we know it in exile. Real brief, but I just want to touch on some real key principles that are going to help us as we sort of walk this out, you know. I I was thinking on that, that you, you you don't choose the field you're planted in, maybe. You don't choose the farm, but you get to choose whether or not there's fruit. And I think Daniel is a perfect example of that. I don't think Daniel chose to be in captivity. I'm pretty certain it wasn't his idea. But he found himself there nonetheless, and he was still a man that produced fruit. And that's why Daniel is one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. That's why, because he's somebody that we can learn so much from about being in circumstances that we didn't expect or understand, but still produce fruit and be what God has called us to be. God's looking for character, not for characters. We're a church, we're a nation, we're a people that likes characters. We like personality. We like it to have bells and whistles. There's nothing inherently wrong with bells and whistles, but if there's no substance, it's only gonna go so far. I believe God wants us to be people of substance. And I believe Daniel's got some keys in here that are gonna open that up for you as they are for me. Um, Character, though, is, is the key that we're gonna talk about this morning to the, to the kingdom. And, and when you get a chance, do reflect on what that means for you. I, I think Daniel was a man of outstanding character who probably served a few characters, if you will. If you look at the different men who he found himself serving underneath. For those of you who don't know the backstory, Israel had already been taken into captivity, but then Babylon comes takes Judah into captivity. They take them all to Babylon, or at least most of them, besides a slight remnant that they leave, and um, Daniel is one of those. So he's, he's pulled right out of his homeland, miles and miles away into this brand new place. And somehow, he is still handpicked for the service of a foreign king. And I think right out of the gate, that speaks something really unique about Daniel. There's not everybody that was put into the king's service. There's a few unique characteristics. In fact, it tells us in verse 4 of chapter 1, the king says, select only strong, healthy, good-looking young men. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve the royal palace. I don't think... These characteristics are what you need to be effective in the kingdom of God. But I think in this scenario, it allowed Daniel an opportunity to have an area of ministry that he wouldn't have had. And not just his good looks. I mean, there's only so much you can do about that. So let's work on other things this morning. But he spent time investing into his character before he ever arrived in Babylon. He was a trained man before he ever came into the king's service, and that is what qualified him to be put in a place of authority while in exile. And I want to applaud every one of you who have done your part to to study and to learn. I think it's so important, and sometimes, you know, I, 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 I... weary of people in in maybe Christian circles or otherwise who think that like, oh, well, we're just going to turn the Holy Spirit up and just fly by the seat of our pants. I love moving by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and he does some amazing things that I can never do in my own strength. But can I tell you, the more you will invest into yourself, the more God has to work with. God can do a lot out of completely nothing, but if you will invest into yourself, if you will take where you are and just invest 
he'll be able to multiply what you pour into. Okay, so Daniel finds himself in this foreign kingdom, serving this foreign king. He's handpicked, and what the king does is they, they bring all these guys together. They say, hey, you guys are the cream of the crop. The king wants you. He wants your advice. He wants your input. We're going to spend three years really investing into you and training you in the ways of Babylon so that you can serve the king in this awesome way. Great. I mean, I, I bet anybody taken from exile would be happy to take that ticket versus the alternative, right? And so they find themselves in this location where now they're being offered the king's food. It's part of their training regiment. You know the story probably. They, they're given all this food to eat. It, I am sure delicious. And Daniel turns it down. Why? Because this is food that by the regulation of the law of his God, he can't eat. And without going into too much detail about the logistics of the food, the problem is food that's sacrificed to idols and that sort of thing. Basically, what he does is he makes a blanket statement and says, listen, I'm not able to eat this. He and his, his three companions that we know well from the fiery furnace, not yet, but they say, listen, we can't eat the king's food. I know, I know it looks good. It smells really good. I want to eat it. I can't because God said I can't. So just give me fruit and vegetables, or vegetables. I said fruit and vegetables because that's what I would rather eat. Not even fruit, just vegetables and water. Delicious. I, that is not my kind of diet. No, thank you, but, but it's, it's what he did. And he has the guts to come and say to the king's official, I can't eat that. Here's my proposition. Can I tell you, if Daniel had not been stepping and walking out in obedience to God up until he reached Babylon, he would, have, he would have just jumped right on the bandwagon with everybody else. It's really easy to serve the Lord when you're in a comfortable location and God's moving and everybody loves Jesus. And, you know, I've so many, Nicole was talking about youth camp scenarios that I've been in and, you know, people are dancing in worship. It's not real hard to get energized for God in that place. But when you go into your workplace and nobody loves Jesus, in fact, they kind of despise him, it becomes a little more difficult to stand up for things that seem like, ah, it's not really a big issue. It's only food. I mean, because really at the end of the day, now on the other side of the cross and we look at the New Testament and we can eat anything we want. But I believe with Daniel, it was a heart issue. Have you ever, I, I think it happens to a lot of us maybe in our first year of college. I saw a lot of my friends coming out of, I went to a private high school and um, you know, you knew who, there were people that were Christians, there were people that weren't, but we were all sort of in this sheltered location. And then the minute you hit your first year of college and like freedom and you're doing your own thing, you sort of see people's true colors and you realize what their character really amounts to. And God has so much grace, and I believe a lot of us have probably been through so many scenarios where we've kind of walked away and God has pulled us back. So today's not about that, whether or not that's, that's your story. The point is, it's really easy to compromise in areas that seem like non-issues. And so this is an area that seems like a non-issue. It's just about eating. It's just about drinking. God, you put me here after all. I'm in captivity. Woe is me. I might as well just eat the king's food because it's all I'm going to get, right? We start throwing ourselves this pity party of, yeah, well, life is terrible, and I might as well just go eat a tub of ice cream or whatever that represents in your life. <laughs> Don't throw in the towel, don't do it. God's got something for you. And if you can just hold on, if you can just hold on to your character, there is something on the other side that is so much better than Ben and Jerry's. The things of the kingdom are, are, are hard for us on the earth to grab onto because they're these elusive things that we can talk about, but it's hard to tangibly see that, and it's easier to grab onto what we see in front of us and to say, well, at least this is what I have. So, no, I want to challenge you to be a man, to be a woman of character, to make the same choices behind closed doors as you do in the wide open, to watch your tongue the same way that you watch your thoughts, the same way that you watch your actions, the same way that you navigate your cable television when nobody else is in the room, the same way that you talk about a friend when he's gone and not have the slip up, you know, when you realize he's standing behind you. That's the worst. 
I think we talked about this in one of the messages that I was sharing, but I remember when God laid on my heart, uh, I feel like, you know, I know now it was the Lord, but then I thought it was the devil, to drive the speed limit. It's like, just drive the speed limit. And I was like, but God, everybody, come on, you guys, you live on the Beltway. You know what I'm talking about. Like, do you, uh, but I've been suffering in traffic, and it's finally open, and everybody's going at least 10 over. And God was like, Jeff, what's the speed limit? <sighs> God, why? Why must you work on my heart? Can't we just work on the external stuff? But he's concerned about deeper stuff. So there was a season of my life where God was telling me to drive five below the speed limit, and I was like crucifying my flesh, you know, behind the driver's seat, like, ah, oh, this is the worst. But God was teaching me a principle in my life that, you know what happened when I, when I drove the speed limit or below the speed limit? Every time I drove by and I saw police lights turn on, I never got scared. Before, it was like, like stomach in my throat. Ah, everybody hits their brakes cumulatively, you know, like the police don't know. I never had to do that because my character was in the right place and it saved me from all these other issues. If you can put your character in the place where it belongs, it's going to save you from a lot of heartache and a lot of worry and a whole lot of anxiety. So Daniel says, test us. Fine. This is what God said. And I'm going to put God to the test. Give us vegetables. Test us after so many days. See how we look. And it says, at the end of the 10 days, in verse 15, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. But here, look at this. See what happens in verse 17. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. I'm not telling you that if you eat broccoli for the whole week, you're going to start knowing what your dreams mean. I can't save you from a bad night of pizza. But what I can tell you is if you will embrace these things that God is challenging your heart. Okay, now we have the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not just about what's in here. It goes further than that, right? Jesus challenged the Pharisees, don't just clean the outside of the cup. Don't just spin yourself and do the rules because you're going to find yourself spinning and spinning and spinning and really tired and not seeing any fruit. But clean the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean also. I want to challenge you to embrace when the Holy Spirit speaks into your life and says, listen, I know it's okay for everybody else to go there, but I don't want you there. That you say, yes, God. Because there's something on the other side that can only be birthed out of your obedience. That's the only way. And we like to get away with as much as we can. You know, I was telling the first service I remember when I was a kid. And, you know, in our house, it was like you, you did not watch TV during the week. That was just the rule. Um, and, you know, then I was like, oh. You know, come on, Dad, everybody else. Did you guys, anybody have one of those, like, everybody else rules that everybody else got to, but you didn't? Ah, oh, it was the worst. And so, you know, we'd do as much as we could to, like, I guess rebel and, like, watch TV while my dad was away. And he, he says, my dad's like a sleuth. He would come home, feel the top of the television, and it's all over because we had that giant tube TV, and there was no hiding that. But I thank God now for this, the principles that were laid in my life as foundations then because I live off of those now. Because Daniel lived out those principles, and we're spending a lot of time on this, but I believe this sets Daniel up for success for the rest of his life. And I want to challenge you to embrace it. Okay, let's move on a little bit here. Um, Daniel, <laughs> we're going to be in Daniel the whole time. We're going to move on to chapter, really the end of chapter one. Don't go far. Maybe flip the page. I don't know. So, so Daniel's in this place of, of, of discipline and embracing discipline, and I don't know whether or not he watched TV. I'm pretty sure he didn't. I don't know whether he would now. Maybe not. I don't know. I, I, just, I just want to camp here for a minute and just ask you what's God speaking to you, and if it's something that you already know, because chances are you already do, because chances are he's already been speaking to you, write it down. But we'll leave it at that. 
But I believe God blesses our choices and he's looking for us to make decisions in our life that go deeper than, than any trend, okay? So don't just look at what everybody else is doing. It's easy to, it's easy to serve God when, when everybody else is, but what's he telling you? Proverbs 12, one says this. Let me just give you a couple quick passages and we'll move on. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. It's in, it's in the Bible. Sorry, it's Sunday morning. I know we have kids here. Embrace it in your life. Hebrews 12, 10 to 11. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Okay, I'm, I'm not telling you it's gonna be easy to eat vegetables. I'm just telling you it's gonna be worth it, figuratively. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the Holy Spirit, and this is our hope, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Jo love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Thank God that we are in a place where we don't have to manufacture patience on our own because I don't know about you, but I think I would be out of luck. But the Holy Spirit is producing it in you. So I also wanna challenge you not to be overwhelmed. You know, if you're like me, you think, okay, I'm just doing this. You know, only this, or I'm cutting everything out, or I'm gonna just do this. And God's all about baby steps. And I love that about him. And he is patient with us, and he will work with us and walk alongside us. And it says in verse 25 of Galatians there, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. It's a Holy Spirit-empowered decision that you're making. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives, okay? So in, in even Daniel's captivity, God was glorified. I want you, okay, to jump over to chapter two, verse 28. It's the tail end of this story, and we're not gonna read it because we don't have the time this morning, but basically the king has his dream. He won't tell his wise men what it, what it was because he wants them to tell him so he has certainty that they know what the interpretation really is. So they're all freaking out. He basically threatens to kill them all, and, you know, that's the end of the story. The guy comes to round them all up. Daniel's one of those guys, and he says, whoa, 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 wait a second. Let me, just give me a day. Let us pray about this. So he gets together with his three friends. They pray. They ask God. God reveals this to him, and he goes to the king, saying, king, here it is. It says in verse 28, but he's saying to the king, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. He uses his opportunity in his captivity to take this, this circumstance, this situation and use it as a light onto who God is. He doesn't use it to say, here's who I am and I am worthy and whatever. He says, listen, all these other enchanters, all these other astrologers, all these other ones have been working on their own strength until they couldn't anymore. You know how I know that? Because the king trusted them up to this point, or maybe he was a little suspicious to the point now where he's like, okay, if you really know what you're talking about, you tell me what my dream was. And they were like, king, we give up. We can't do that. And Daniel was the only one who said, listen, I can do it. The reason being, because up to this point and beyond, he'd been trusting in God to be his strength, not in himself. So can I challenge you to put your trust and your hope in God so that he can be glorified to you and he can be glorified through you so that he can reveal himself to you in your life and in your circumstances and that he can use even those circumstances in captivity to bring glory to who he is and to his name. Okay, so let's just jump on from here. If you jump over to chapter four, we're gonna skip right over the fiery furnace because Daniel wasn't there at the time. And we're gonna go to chapter four where the king has another bad dream. I mean, really. What has he been eating? I don't know. His food. He should have been eating vegetables. Yeah, whatever, king. He has this terrible dream, and I'll summarize it for you, but of this giant tree, and it's kind of this glorious thing, and all of a sudden, you know, it's stripped of all of its glory and, and cut down to just a stump, and basically the tree represented the king and what was gonna happen to him if he didn't obey God, which was that he was gonna walk around like a wild animal for seven years, and his hair was gonna grow long, and his fingernails, and they don't teach this story in Sunday school on the flannel graph most times, so read it. It's in chapter four. You can read it this week, but... 
So he calls Daniel. He calls Daniel and says, you know, interpret this dream. Or anyway, Daniel finds himself in front of the king. But it's verse three before the king, because this, this narrative is, is coming from Nebuchadnezzar, but before the king even sets up this whole story, you see in verse three the king's acknowledgement of who God is because of Daniel's faithfulness. He says, how great are his signs, God's signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever. His rule through all generations. One thing that I love about Daniel is what you see when he gives the king his interpretation. He says in verse 19 of chapter 4, Upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. The king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belteshazzar replied, that's Daniel, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. Can we take a moment, because I feel like this verse is one of the deepest revelations into Daniel's character and probably one of the strongest parallels to our Savior, Jesus Christ. That in this season of Daniel's life, after being taken from his home forcibly, being thrust into the king's service, being forced to a place that he doesn't want to be, and whether or not the circumstances were great and whatever food that he got to eat, it's not his ideal serving location, and he's serving a king that is not a godly king. Yet he might acknowledge God, but he is not a godly king. You ever find yourself, don't raise your hand, working for an employer that's not godly or serving somebody that's not godly or under the leadership of somebody that's not godly and just, I mean, analyze yourself maybe for a moment. What, what was your attitude? Was it Daniel's who says, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. Daniel, who has a genuine love for King Nebuchadnezzar, let that sink in. What? Why? Because Daniel understood a simple truth, and that is that he was serving God and he was not serving man. That wherever he was and whatever season that he was in, he was serving a higher power. And he trusted God. We've got to come to a place where we trust God enough not to complain every day about our president. Can I get real for a second? No matter what political party you represent, doesn't matter. It's always the same, every term, every election, every everything. We all complain about the malicious nature of the other side. I never saw Daniel do that once, and I know we don't get his complete diary here, but I feel like this verse gives us a deep glimpse into the heart of Daniel and the heart of Christ that asks us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and to serve those who are in authority over us because God put them there. That'll mess with your theology. God put him there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 17. It says, for the, Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. Can I tell you something? Those in authority right now, whether they be in our government or whether they be in a school that you work at or, or go to or your job, those in authority believe they are doing the right thing by and large. I know we like to vilify our enemies and say that, you know, they're walking down the wrong path and they're just wanting to destroy this nation. And no, they are not. They're not. They believe God sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. And the choices that they make might be some terrible, terrible choices. But God can work through Nebuchadnezzar. He can surely work through me. He can surely work through our leaders. I want to challenge you this week because this is tough to chew on to begin to love those in authority over you, to begin to pray for them, not just pray that they would leave office. Begin to legitimately pray for them and their families that what they do would succeed, that our nation would be steered in the right direction because of the decisions that they make. And even if we don't agree with them, that God would have his way. Those are the people that God's called us to be. And it's tough. It's tough when the rubber hits the road, but that's what God has asked of us. And you can tell this is Daniel's heart because he doesn't just do it once. He serves a predecessor of Nebuchadnezzar, sort of, Nebuchadnezzar comes into power, takes him into captivity. After him is Nebuchadnezzar's son, 
evil Merodach, who we see in scripture, then a brother of his, Nergal Sherezer, then another son of his, then Nabonidus, who is under that, and then him and his vassal, uh, Belshazzar. And then after that, the Medes and the Persian comes in. There's another, at least two kings over the course of Daniel's whole time in exile, mind you, and he serves them with love and faithfulness. And we can't wait four years. 70 years Daniel's in exile and served and loved. Let it challenge you this morning. To by the time that Belshazzar comes along and, and then is dethroned and then he goes to the Medes and the Persians, Darius is also looking for somebody to serve and he handpicks Daniel. At this entire time, about 65 or so years after the exile has taken place, where we believe Daniel was probably a teenager, so we're talking he's in his 70s or 80s. Still, he was a man of such character that Darius handpicks him to be over, he, he split his whole province into 120 different provinces, and then he, he put three leaders over those 120, and Daniel was one of those three. He picks him because he saw that he was a man of character who genuinely served. And then we come to this very familiar story where those that are brought into service with Daniel don't like the fact that the king is about to put him in charge of all of them. If only we could be childlike to the point of our faith like Daniel was when he started his journey and hang on to that and remember that if we can embrace those character issues in our life, they will carry us to the point where we're in our 80s. I don't think about that when I read the story, that Daniel was in his 80s and still made a decision. You think like, okay, I'm in my 80s, I give up. Just eat me, lion. You know, I don't like, I'm ready to go. All these years of captivity, I'm done thrown into the lion's den. You know why? Because it says they, could find, they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. God, help me to be that in my 30s. Forget about my 80s. Our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. But, it says, when Daniel learned the law had been signed in verse 10 of chapter 6, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. As usual. It was a pattern in his life. It was something established a long time ago. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Almost 70 years of age, 80 years of age, after a lifetime of struggle, from the bottom of the pit, the king calls out, and what's the first word out of his mouth? I hate you, king. Long live the king. Still, his heart didn't change. Thrown to the lions by his enemy, he still loved them. And it says in, in verse 28 of chapter 6, so Daniel prospered. It's a different way than I would determine to find the word prosper but it's what God intended for him. Would you stand with me this morning? There's one final verse that I wanna share with you as we close. And uh, I wanna invite the prayer team to come forward because when we do, we're not gonna have a large you know, altar response time or anything, but if, if you want prayer in any of these areas, uh, if you feel God challenging you and you just want an empowering prayer to help you kind of through this week as you start navigating that, our team would love to join with you in prayer and partner with you and just really pray on your behalf that God would empower you to be Daniel in your circumstances, to have character, to have love manifest in your life. But the final verse that I wanna share is this. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. No, you might not be looking for riches or a robe or a kingdom, but you're gonna find life and the life that God always designed for you to have. Yeah.